All right. So, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Good yep. morning. Yep. Excellent. Welcome to the first session of our OMS expedition series. Uh, my name is Gabriel Taylor. I'm a senior consultant at Model Technology. Con oh, sorry, Solution Architect. I got a promotion and I forgot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Model Technology Solutions. Uh, this is the first session of a series on OMS. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, I'm going to try and stay in front of this microphone so you guys in the room can hear me. If at any point you can't, let me know. I'll shift my position. <laughs> so uh, today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about what the series goal is. From there, talk about OMS at an overview at a high level just to set the stage. From there, we're going to dive into each of the core tools in Operations Management Suite today and talk about the benefits that can be gained from those in your environments today. Uh, and then have a little demo, show off some of the tools, and have a dedicated Q&A time near the end. If you do have questions before that time and you just can't wait, feel free, raise your hand. I'll probably repeat the question into the recording, but uh, we'll go from there. Uh, otherwise, save questions at the end. We'll have dedicated time there to talk. A um, little bit of housekeeping to start. Thank you to Microsoft for letting us use their space. I don't know if any of them are actually here in the room, but oh well. Um, again, we are recording. We are, this is going to be dedicated Q&A time. I already talked about all this, so we'll just keep going. So. The goal of this series, uh, we've talked to a lot of customers who have thoughts about OMS, they've heard about OMS, but they don't really know how OMS can benefit them today. A lot of people, and you may or may not fall into this bucket, but a lot of people we've spoken to think that OMS, because it's a cloud service and a collection of cloud services, really doesn't relate to their on-prem infrastructure they have today. They don't have a footprint in Azure or anywhere else. What does Operations Management Suite matter to them? And what we really want to do through this present, through this series, is talk about and demonstrate the benefit that OMS can bring to your existing environment, the benefits that it can deliver to you today, regardless of where you are on a migration to the cloud or screw the cloud or planning a hybrid infrastructure, or whatever you're doing, wherever you're at. We want to make sure that you know how OMS can fit into what you're doing and provide you value today. So each of the sessions is going to be a combination of an overview of a different area versus a scenario-based deep dive trying to explore how to solve a specific problem with OMS. Um, today's scenario, today's session, is basically an overview of the whole series. I'm, I'm just going to dim the lights. Um, that's actually nice. OK, well, future sessions, deep dives. We're going to be posting the future sessions online on YouTube. Um, every two to three weeks, we'll have a new session going up. This is going to be, I think we have like six months or so of this planned. So there'll be plenty of sessions upcoming. Pay attention to our social media space for more information about that and direct links. Um, we also are working to set up a few more in-person events for uh, scenarios and deep dives that we think will be very beneficial and will draw a crowd. Um, so keep your eyes out. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or any information or interest. Today's session, introducing the tool set, we're going to aim for like a 100, 200 level talk about the tools, not go too deep in the woods, but just give an overview of what they are, how they work, and how they can benefit you today. Show them off a little bit. I'm traditionally bad at not going deep into the woods, so if I do start going too deep, I'm sure someone will throw something at me and we'll adjust from there. The main goal for this one is just to set the stage for future presentations so we have kind of a baseline of information going into the deep dives. So before we get really started, I've got a couple questions for people out there in the room today. How many of you have already heard of Operations Management Suite in some capacity? Good number of hands. Awesome. How many of you are actually using it in one way or another, any part of it at all? Got a few hands. Cool, cool. Um, how many are using System Center Operations Manager? A lot of hands. Data Protection Manager? We got a few hands. It's actually more than I expected. <laughs> Virtual Machine Manager? Definitely some hands there. Orchestrator? Cool. The reason I bring up those four products typically is because the tools in Operations Management Suite directly map to a lot of the functionality and integrate, integrate directly with those products. So there's a lot of ways we can use your current infrastructure and your current 
uh, investments to uh, get more benefit and value out of the OMS tool set. There's also ways we can take the OMS tool set and map it to what you're currently doing in those tools to see about improving what you're doing and getting more value out of your buck. So let's first talk about just some of the common challenges of IT operations that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. Um, IT, as you know, is in a very transitional state right now with a lot of transition to cloud solutions, hybrid cloud, cloud this, cloud that. And I know that from conversations I've had, I've met a lot of people who hear that they're kind of being left behind, that their traditional infrastructure is not being addressed by this change. Um, additionally, some of the, sorry, uh, traditional IT has a lot of structural issues to it that, that get in the way of transitioning to this cloud model. Uh, there's a lot of silos, there's a lot of different teams that each have their own tools and are responsible for their own services and parts of the infrastructure that sometimes it's hard for them to really work together and it's hard to really troubleshoot issues because you've got to adapt to different teams, different ways of working. Um, responding to issues can be slow and reactive instead of getting ahead of issues and taking proactive steps to address infrastructure issues. Uh, additionally, a lot of the problem with old environments, when you've got a decade or more old environment, you've got different components have been added on over time and layered on. You've got staff that have moved in and moved out and changed positions. And it may be you've got a lot of stuff in your environment that was originally set up, but the people who set it up, the reasons for why it was set up, the design, the con connections, the configuration, all of that has been lost to documents or to time that people don't know where to find, people who aren't there anymore. It makes for a challenging scenario to really understand your current environment, and you've got to understand what you're doing now before you can really move on to the future, to a hybrid infrastructure. Otherwise, you risk losing and uh, losing data, losing, uh, causing problems, and nobody wants that. So. This is a nice Microsoft promise the moon slide, but uh, I want to talk about what the, the goal here is. So the overall idea behind OMS is talking about transforming the way that we're managing IT, talking about taking what's been done in the past, what we're doing in the future, and bringing it all together taking control of what we have in the infrastructure today, taking control of our IT operations space, and providing a bridge to better adapt to new technologies and new capabilities. Additionally, we're talking about getting a more proactive view of the infrastructure, getting a better idea, a better handle of what's happening today, how things map out, how things talk, what are issues that exist that you may not, might not know about until they cause a problem that we can identify beforehand and solve before it actually becomes an issue. Additionally, we're talking about the whole true management anywhere. We're going to bring everything into a single pane of glass. I know that's been a promise that's been uh, promised by Microsoft and many other vendors for probably five, 10 or more years now, uh, bring everything into a single management layer. However, what we the reality is that people are still using an array of disparate tools from an array of vendors, different things providing different value for different groups. And like I mentioned before, that tends to, while useful in that each of those tools may be very good and very powerful, it also means that different people in the organization are having to learn a larger array of tools and having to hop between different tools to get the same jobs done. Bringing it all together in one space can have that can benefit that by making it easier for you to find issues and find data and respond to them and get things up on top without problems. So this is where we bring in the operations management suite. OMS is Microsoft's all-in-one hybrid cloud management solution for anybody to manage their infrastructure, manage your application workloads, no matter where they're at, no matter where you're at in terms of the state of your infrastructure. Whether you are leveraging cloud solutions today, whether they're in Azure or Amazon or anywhere else, whether they are SaaS solutions, PaaS solutions, or whether you're still wholly on-prem, or whether you're some combination thereof, OMS has ways, has a place in that state to help bring your information together, to collect your machine data, to give you more tools to sit on top of everything and provide you benefits for what you're doing today. For the purposes of this OMS exhibition series, again, we want to talk, we want to focus on how this can benefit you in your on-prem environment today. 
don't know where you're at in terms of your cloud strategy, but we want to make sure that we're explaining how this can benefit you on-prem in your existing environment today. So Operation Management Suite is built around four main pillars of feature sets, four main pillars of target solutions. Uh, these are insight and analytics, security and compliance, protection recovery, automation and control. Just to sum up what these do, the idea behind insight and analytics is enabling you to gain visibility into your infrastructure and provide knowledge to both rapidly troubleshoot and pro proactively solve problems before they happen. Uh, security and compliance is, intent, is the bucket that is intended to provide a deep, thorough, and centralized interface so that you guys can fully assess, monitor, and manage the security status of your infrastructure. Make sure that you're secure. Make sure that you don't have any uh, openings, holes, malware, et cetera. Both of these are both of those two, law, inside analytics, security and compliance, those are mainly covered by the log analytics tool. Um, additional area, automation and control. This is intended to enable speed and reliability across your infrastructure by turning server management and standard tasks into set and forget sort of tasks so that you can take the standard things you do day to day, wrap them up in some code easily, and just let them happen and know that those tasks are taken care of, that you're given the tools to monitor and make sure those tasks are taken care of so you can free up your time to work on more things and more interesting things and more time to proactively address issues in the environment. The final column is protection recovery, which is intended to increase availability and provide flexible, customized, automated disaster recovery plans. Uh, this is automation control is primarily served by the Azure Automation and Azure Automation DSC tools. And protection recovery is primarily served by uh, the Azure Recovery Services, which is the blanket for Azure Backup and Azure Site Recovery. What we'll see as we navigate through these is that they're not standalone tools, though. There are, there's deep integration between all the tools in the suite. There's a lot of ways that they talk to each other. While they all are intended to solve these pillars of, air, of issues, they all work together really well to build on top of each other and provide you value that you can use these tools to really get value out of your infrastructure. So we're going to start off by going into Azure Backup. We're going to start off talking about Azure Backup from there, Site Recovery, from there, Azure Automation and DSC, and then we're going to f finish off with Log Analytics. Uh, Log Analytics is going to be my favorite. There's also just the biggest areas. We're going to build up to that so we have the most, most interesting chunk at the end. But uh, there's nothing not interesting about these early parts. So Azure Backup, uh, when we talk about differentiating Azure Backup from other backup providers, Azure Backup is a true cloud service. It is a software as a service and actually also a uh, platform as a service, SaaS and PaaS solution from Microsoft. Um, it differs from the other, soft, other uh, backup solutions out there by being truly wholly built for the cloud. And what does that mean? Because that's an easy thing to say, but how do you back that up? When we talk about other services, other backup services that leverage the cloud, they're usually doing it in one of two ways, either cloud as a storage target or cloud as another data center. Both of these work, but they have added costs and added complexity to them. Oftentimes, they'll require additional infrastructure on-prem. They'll require you to be paying for not just the storage, but the compute costs of running the machines, whether they are in a cloud IaaS solution or elsewhere, to support all your backups. They're going to require you to pay for the different types of data. Uh, additionally, a lot of these treat the cloud as just in their dummy storage pool, where in order to recover data from it, you've got to pull all that data down, pull the entire recovery point down, just to get a few files. Azure Backup is structured with a cloud-first view that helps differentiate it and get rid of a lot of those limitations. Instead of having to maintain infrastructure in a cloud service, in some other data center, it's entirely a, a service provider at Microsoft. Whatever you have pumping data out to Azure Backup, it talks directly to the Azure APIs and stores data directly in Azure. No need to maintain any cloud resources out there aside from your recovery vault where that data is stored. When you want to recover data from it, you don't have to pull down all your data just to get a few files and folders. You're able to selectively pull data out of the cloud service and just download what you need. 
it provides a number of tools that makes it a lot easier, a lot of capabilities that makes it a lot easier and faster to recover your data and get back up and running when you had an issue and need to, re to restore. Are you prepared to discuss anything about licensing costs? Uh, I'm not pr uh, fully planning on doing licensing t costs in this day. I can tell you the licensing model for Azure Backup and Azure Recovery Services are entirely pay-as-you-go. It's you pay only for the data consumption that you use. All data that you send out to Azure Backup is compressed, so the amount that's stored out there is less than what's sent. Additionally, it's wholly built around incremental backups. Um, I was actually going to talk about that in a future slide, but I will get moving on that a little faster. Um, I guess as a general question, I'm, I would guess that the cost of storage in the cloud has come down over the past two years. Last time I looked at this, mm -hmm. it was about a minimum of 25 grand for 10 terabytes. And I'm guessing, I'm hoping it might be lower now. So for the recording at home, questions about how much uh, does it cost to store data in Azure Backup. Like I said, I don't have the, the numbers on me right now, and obviously with Microsoft licensing, the there's going to be lots of discounts and detailed stuff that I wouldn't be qualified to go into the details of your account. But um, I can say that one of the benefits that Azure Backup has versus other vendors is the fact that everything is compressed, everything is incremental backups. So while you are storing data out there and you are paying for however much data you're storing, you're not storing as much as you're backing up because it's all compressed, and it's all incremental backups so that you're only, each new backup, each new recovery point is just the delta between the previous recovery point and the new one. One of the benefits that Azure Backup brings to the space versus, versus its competitors in regards to incremental backups is that, in, just like I was mentioning before, with not having to bring everything down, with the way the data is stored, being just show, storing the delta, but by making everything available through this cloud API, you can easily recover all the data that's there, no matter how far back in time that data's from. Let's say we've got 20 recovery points out there, 20 different snapshots. Each one is built off that first one, just showing the deltas between the previous snapshot. And you want to recover data from that first initial, that's only in that initial backup that hasn't changed. You're going to be able to access that just as easily, just as quickly as the most recent data you backed up, because it's all exposed the same way. Um, Azure Backup is a heterogeneous solution. You can use it to back up stuff from on-prem. You can use backup cloud workloads, doesn't matter where your workloads are at. Using the Azure Backup components, you can back up files and folders, you can back up application workloads, you can it, direct integration with several tools on-prem. Um, we are looking at best-in-class protection for Microsoft workloads. And I know it's often a concern for any cloud service is security. With Azure Backup, all data is encrypted before it leaves your data center. It's entirely encrypted in transit and at rest. There is no way for anybody to get into that. Uh, it's secure. <laughs> Could you go so far as to say that if your current on-prem environment meets certain compliance standards, moving some data out to Azure would not affect that? So the question is about compliance standards. If your current environment meets certain on-prem compliance standards, would that be affected by moving data out to Azure? That's a good question. So I don't know if you um, are aware, you probably are. Azure has an array, Microsoft has an array of compliance uh, qualifications, certifications rather, for Azure services. If you go out to, um, I think it's, there's a website for it, I can pull it up later. There's a dedicated web page on the Azure website that talks about all of its capabilities, all of its standard compliance, and everything connected with that. The caveat, of course, is depending on how you are using the various Azure services, it can affect whether or not that compliance applies to what you're doing. But for their SaaS and PaaS solutions like this, because they're controlling how that data is stored, you're the one who has access to it. You access it via the vault credentials that you configure, that are configured with your recovery services vault. Nothing else can decrypt that data aside from those credentials, but, and that is entirely in your hands. But the security on the back end is, because it is not reliant on you to configure it, it's part of the service, it's gonna inherit 
a, uh, all, if not a lot, of those uh, compliance capabilities. On the Azure website, it does break down by its SaaS and PaaS services what the compliance is for each of those areas. And I don't recall off the top of my head what the state is for Azure Backup, but I do believe last I checked that it's going to be fully compliant with all your standard uh, HIPAA, Dodd-Frank, etc. cetera. Um, so I don't know. Well, I imagine the, the answer to your question, to put it short, is that unless you do things in a non-normal way, so long as you're using the service, then you should not affect your compliance state uh, using the service. Trust Center. Trust Center, that's the name of the website, Azure Trust Center. So as far as what you can back up with Azure Backup, um, <clears throat> You can leverage, so if you have Data Protection Manager on-prem today, for those of you who raised your hands and those of you watching this recording later, you can integrate Data Protection Manager with Azure Backup to use Azure Backup as a target for extended backups. This can be used to replace tape in your environment. You can use tape, DPM allows you to use tape, but you can also, instead of using tape or alongside your tape, push that data to Azure Backup for further retention and recovery out in the Azure service. Additionally, you, if you don't have DPM, you can stand up the, an Azure Backup server on-prem, which is, you could describe it as like a slimmed down data protection manager. There are similarities there, but it is an entire bit of software designed purely as a front end for Azure Backup so that you can select your application workloads, your SQL databases, your virtual machines, uh, SharePoint Exchange, et cetera, and have those workloads backed up to Azure Backup. Um, you also can deploy the Azure Backup agent directly to computers in order to use that for file and folder backups. So in that case, we can deploy it straight to our various client machines or servers if needed, file shares, et cetera, and configure it to automate the backup of that data out to the Azure Backup service. Um, some of the cool things with the Azure Backup service, uh, as you'd expect, you can restore data to this, the originating machine or to a different machine. Uh, but there's also a new feature that literally just came out last month called Instant Restore that allows you to mount your recovery points as a virtual drive so you can open up in File Explorer and directly interact with that backed up data, directly pull it down the same way you would any, anything else in File Explorer. Uh, now, again, one of the benefits of this, as I mentioned before, the way Azure stores or Azure Backup stores data is incremental backups, but you have access to all of the data that's in there at any time. So if you were to mount a recovery point from, say, last Thursday, it doesn't matter if the data that you're looking for was backed up on last Thursday or if it was backed up two weeks prior or two months prior or whatever. You're going to see the latest version of that data as of that recovery point there in File Explorer ready for you to copy and move just like you would any uh, other mounted drive. As far as retention period goes, Azure Backup supports 9,999 recovery points per protected instance. Now, a protected instance could be a computer, it could be an application, it could be whatever it is that you're protecting. But we're looking at almost 10,000 separate recovery points in the service. Depending on how often your backup is, how frequently you have it scheduled, that's years of data that you have access to. And it's not data that's sitting offline in a warehouse somewhere. We have to go and grab, find the right tape, grab it, hook it up, load it up, pull the data off, hope that no weird wear has happened to it. All of that data is right there, ready for you to get the same way as any other data anytime you need to get it. Um, as it says up there, at a rate of one backup per day, you got more than 27 years of, of data there. If you're backing it up more frequently, back up twice a day and you'll have uh, math, 14 years, 13 and a half years. <laughs> and if you're backing up on a slower cadence, one week or whatnot, it's going to push out even more. It's honestly, the amount of time you can have that backup, that data backed up, is going to far outweigh, <laughs> far outpace the amount of time you're probably going to need it. But you're not paying extra for that. Again, you're only paying for the data consumption. Once it's there, then you're saving that data that's there, and you're not paying for the hardware, you're not paying for the compute cost, you're not paying for power and storage, or, well, storage, just storage. So like I mentioned before, this can entirely replace your need for tape backups. It can totally move you past that point. 
So we're going to go into Azure Site Recovery. Once we finish the Azure Site Recovery talk, we'll hop onto the Azure portal and look at the interface for these out in Azure. I'm also going to look at the Azure Backup Agent to show how we can easily uh, access backups and schedule backups. Now, Azure Site Recovery, as I mentioned before, is intended for protection and recovery. It's intended for making your DR solution more resilient, more easy to use, more flexible. And when we talk about DR, I really want to stress or really talk about uh, where IT disasters come from. Now, this slide, it's a, in white at the bottom, but there's a citation there. This is from data collected by Forrester back in 2014. Um, and most people, when they think of situations where they need to use a disaster recovery scenario, they're thinking of major events. They're thinking of earthquakes or tornadoes or terrorists or who knows what, something big. But the reality is that most situations where disaster recovery plans come into play have nothing to do with extreme events. Rather, they're generated by operational failures. Power went down or the hardware failed or there was a software bug, something like that. Things that are really mundane that theoretically are easy to recover from, but can be thorns in the side. However, if you're running an application, if your business requires this application to stay up and running 24 seven, regardless of what's happening, regardless of hardware failures, we need a way to facilitate that. This is where Azure Backup comes into play. So more talk about challenges for disaster recovery scenarios. Um, a lot of disaster recovery solutions, they're expensive. You've got to have a separate data center somewhere that you're storing all of those additional hardware in, additional um, resources. You have to pay for power and cooling and everything else. And it's just sitting there not being used. But testing it, a lot of people don't test their DR plans as often as they need. They just assume that their application's working, assume that they're going to be able to fail over and it'll all work because you can't test it without affecting prod, right? So there's a lot of challenges there on the DR front. ASR provides us a way to get beyond that and leverage the cloud to better implement a disaster recovery solution that enables us to quickly test it, quickly provide, get things back up and running when there are problems, and validate that things are working and being protected without affecting our production environment. It also enables us, because we're not paying for all that hardware in the, in the data center site, we also have the ability to back up more, protect more of our infrastructure at a lower cost. If it costs less to, to protect a different machine, then the same budget's gonna get you a lot more protection. It's gonna give, give you a lot more recovery capability for the same buck, or you can re, re divest that money elsewhere. So one of the benefits of ASR is that it's going to support your workloads regardless of where they're at. ASR has solutions both for Hyper-V and for VMware and for physical machines. Doesn't matter if the operating system that's running on those virtual guests is going to be Windows or Linux. This takes care of it. Azure Site Recovery gives you an automated replication and policy-based disaster recovery plan that you can customize, that you can build and automate and make very flexible. Instead of simply grouping some servers together and hitting go, with ASR you can actually build out recovery plans that put your, not just put your servers in groups, but orchestrate what needs to come up in what order. And you can add different steps in there as well. You can say, after the, this server, needs, my domain control needs to come up first. After the DC, we need to run these scripts to prep different parts of the infrastructure. Then we can bring up these servers. Then we have to wait for someone to sign off and do a manual step, or we need to do something else automated. We can coordinate all of that together inside the service so that your disaster recovery plans, your failover plans can have more power, more flexibility. You can put all of that into the solution so that you have less work to do. You can really reduce it down to a one-click failover. Because we have those, that flexibility within the service, we're able to do things like multi-tier and application consistent recoveries. We're able to bring up the application in its tiered state, making sure the database comes online first, before the application servers, before the web front ends, uh, because we're able to coordinate that. 
We also get full monitoring in ASR of the health of our servers on-prem, making sure that they are replicating, making sure we have all that data, as well as wherever we're replicating them to. And I say wherever we're replicating them to because ASR, the, the primary use case that I think is the best use case is replicating out to Azure, using Azure in your secondary data center. Because what you can do with that you can configure your virtual networks and can map your, your protected servers to virtual machines so that when you need to fail over, Azure will automatically spin up the infrastructure you need on the Azure side, loading up your data and your machines so that they don't seem like they've gone offline, that it's just a complete continuation of your network. Um, but if you don't want to replicate to Azure, if you want to use this as a tool to manage replication between your data centers that you have today, if you're not ready to go to Azure, that's fine. We can do that today. We can use ASR as a tool, getting all of the capabilities of its recovery plans, its flexibility, and use that to migrate our, our computers from one data center to another data center on-prem. This has their scenarios along with it as well. Because it supports physical servers and VMware and uh, Hyper-V, we have the ability to convert on the fly between them to a degree. Hyper-V is going to get replicated out to Azure as an Azure virtual machine, and it's going to be replicated to another data center as Hyper-V. But if you've got a physical machine, if you want to do a physical to virtual transition, you can use ASR to do that. You can set up the replication of your physical machine, have that fail over, and it's going to spit out a vSphere virtual machine for you at the end. Or you can just spit that straight into Azure and run it in Azure. This is going to integrate with Azure Automation as part of your recovery plans. So those bits that I talked about with being able to put in automation to your recovery plans, that involves direct integration with Azure Automation. So that's first sign of things talking to each other. Any sort of automation we build in the Azure Automation service, we can leverage as part of our recovery plans, which is to say anything you can script in Power, PowerShell. Literally anything you can script in PowerShell can be implemented as part of your DR plan automatically. So benefits for why we want to use Azure Site Recovery today. Because we're using an Azure, uh, Microsoft product, got a lot of Microsoft workloads on-prem between your Windows servers, if you're Hyper-V if you're running it, your other application workloads, we're able to guarantee and certify that it's all going to work together. We don't have to worry about as many third-party vendors, different levels of support, different support for different things. It's all Microsoft, it all works. Um, additionally, because this supports both vSphere and Hyper-V, because it supports your physical servers and your virtual machines, you get true one tool to handle all your application. You don't have to worry about using uh, SRM for these virtual machines, but then we've got uh, another product over here for these ones, and we've got this other scenario in this section of the infrastructure. You can just use ASR for all of it. Because you are able to save money on your secondary data center, you can also protect more of your infrastructure at the same time for the same buck because you don't have to pay for as many resources on the back end. Additionally, if you are looking for a cloud transition model, ASR provides it because once you are replicating your virtual machines, once you're replicating your servers, you can restore them in Azure, and you don't have to fail them back if you don't want to. You can. There's, obviously, you can fall, fail back from Azure. But once they're in Azure, you can start leveraging those Azure services. You can start leveraging the benefits that Azure can bring, making a very smooth transition from what you have now to where you might want to go if you have an Azure strategy. There's also another really important use for this. Azure Site Recovery allows you to failover and do test failovers without affecting your production machines. You can do a failover into Azure, set up on an isolated network or series of virtual networks that is completely separated from everything else, which means if you need to validate that different patches aren't going to break your application, or you need to validate what happens if you make these changes, but you don't have a dedicated test environment, you can use ASR as an on-demand test environment. All those virtual machines you're replicating, just fail them over into Azure, then do an isolated network, do your testing, apply your patches, make whatever changes you want, and validate, does it work, does it not work? Once it's done, 
once you've done your validations, blow up, blow the uh, cloud version away. You don't need to keep it anymore. It only exists when you need it. That way you can do your testing without affecting production, understanding what that change is going to have, on, what effect that change is going to have on your production environment without any risk. So we're going to hop over to the Azure portal real quick and take a look at what the interface looks like for recovery services out there in Azure. So I'm over here on the Azure portal inside a recovery services vault. The recovery services vault is where both Azure Backup and Azure Site Recovery live. This is Microsoft unifying its backup protection recovery solutions into a single location to add support for further integration and capabilities between them. So since this unification has happened, Azure has had a number of additional backup solutions applied to it. There's a number of capabilities in the Azure uh, services itself that can back up to Azure Backup. If you're using Azure services today, those can be very useful. If you're not, that's a little bit less relevant, which is why I haven't mentioned it now. But the point is that by unifying all of this into a single recovery services vault, you've got one place to go for all of your backup and protection capabilities. When we're out here, we can easily see if we have any problems with our current backups. You can see that currently I'm backing up two different items to geo-redundant storage. Again, one of the benefits of leveraging the cloud is built-in redundancy, but you're only paying for that compute or for the, the storage back. Um, right now, the data I'm backing up is being backed up to multiple Azure data centers. So not only it, can it survive a hardware failure inside a DVD data center, if something happened and an entire da Azure data center went off the map, my data would still be protected. I can see right away how much is totally backed up. I can see if any backups are currently happening. You can click into these as well to see what the status of those jobs are. Additionally, on the site recovery side, I can see what I'm replicating out to Azure. From there, I can configure failovers and more. Excuse me. Yes? The vault location within the server, is that also uh, replicated across the server data center? So as far as the vault location? Yeah, so I get the print. My data is in the vault data center. That's fine. But you can't get any money. So um, that's a very good question. The question is, is the vault itself replicated across multiple data centers? And I don't have a great answer for that right now because I, I don't know the underlying bit of how the Azure resource groups work because the vault itself and other, other Azure resources are tied to what's called a resource group that's located at one of the Azure data centers. Now there's redundancy obviously built into that data center and you are in most cases able to move resource groups between one data center to another. But as to what happens with the resource group, if that data center were to suddenly get wiped off the map, I don't have, a, have an answer on that right now. I'll have to look that up and get back to you on that, because that's a good question. I've got the question. Oh, we've got an answer, actually. I don't have the answer. I have the oh, question. we've got the question. Never mind. So <laughs> we've got that written down. We can get back to you later. Last I knew it was tied to subscription. Yeah, it is tied to subscription. Theoretically, your subscription. You can access when you get, when you connect your subscription. You are connecting to your resources across all Azure sites. But uh, as to what happens to a resource located at site A, if site A fell into the ocean, theoretically, it would become, become available elsewhere. But I don't know for certain. That would be a, it's a great question to find out. <laughs> So in addition to immediately seeing what we have here, we can also immediately configure backup and replication. Um, if we're backing up on-prem workloads, this wizard here is really just going to punt us to the, on, the uh, on-prem capabilities. We can select what we want to back up, files and folders, virtual machines of Hyper-V or vSphere, uh, SQL Server, SharePoint Exchange, system states, BMRs. Depending on what we select, it's going to basically point us to either the Azure backup agents to deploy onto the servers you want to get data from, or the Azure backup server to deploy on-prem to use as the gateway to grab that data and send it up to Azure. If we wanted to configure replication, 
we would come here because when we configure application, whether we're using the vSphere application or the Hyper-V application, we install a provider that talks to those hosts in our environment. We can come right away and select our host environment, and it's going to give us a list of virtual machines. From here, we can just click the virtual machine, configure our settings for replication, and bam, it's going to start replicating out. You can see I've got a bunch of settings here. I'm not going to go into detail because I'm trying to keep this 100, 200 level. Um, but it's fact to say we can configure that right here from the cloud. If we want to look at what we're backing up, if we want to actually recover the data we're backing up, we're going to need to use the tool we use to back it up. So if we're backing up files and folders via the backup agent, we're going to need to hop over to a backup agent in order to restore those files and folders. It does not have to be on the originating machine, but we'll need to use the backup agent. Alternatively, if we're backing up a workload via the backup server, we just hop onto a backup server and, and go. If something happens to those servers, you just connect a new, uh, spin up a new one, connect a new, connect it to the recovery sources vault via the vault credentials that you get from here, and it's still fully accessible. Question. Does that, under backup management type there, does DPM refer to a a machine with a data protection manager agent installed? It's referring to data that's coming from DPM. So whether that is file and folder data that's being backed up via DPM and being sent out to Azure Backup, or whether it is um, work, application workloads, bare metal recovery, system state, et cetera, that's being protected by DPM and sent out to Azure Backup, that's going to tell you the number of items that's being, that's coming, that are coming from that data source. So if I had an existing DPM infrastructure, that would refer to data coming from my DPM server rather Correct. than uh, directly from the client. Correct. So uh, the question is, does this number referring to data from the DPM server versus clients? The answer is yes. If we were had, if you have a DPM infrastructure in your environment today and you connect it to Azure Backup to have that data replicated out to the Azure Backup service, that's going to get counted in here as DPM data. That's where that's the data source. So going back over some, if we go into the Azure Site Recovery side of things, we can see I've got two uh, domain controllers being replicated out to Azure right now so that if my domain on-prem went down and I need to make sure I recovered all of my user information, I can just restore those out to Azure and keep things going. Or restore the secondary data center if you'd like to use that. We can look at the, the replication settings for a given machine, validate they're healthy, validate uh, the different types of recovery points we have for them. Note that for this server right now, it's not available for app consistent just because the uh, I don't have that configured for the server here right now. If you are replicating out application workloads, things like um, SQL Server that are that do support application consistent backups, we'll be able to get that data right here and see when that last data came in. From here, we can configure the mapping for that server if it's just restored out to Azure. We can see information about that server. If we were to restore it to Azure, fail it over to Azure, we would configure here what network to connect it to, what the target subnet would be. If we wanted to put a specific IP address on there, we could do that. What sort of Azure virtual machine it would go to, et cetera. So there's a lot of capabilities for controlling that. And as far as recovery plans go, if we were to build one out, we come through it, we just make a quick name. Doesn't like my semicolon. And it's going to give us the ability to, okay, well, got to go through the wizard. I'll add some machines. And once I add those in here, we'll have the capability of configuring how that recovery plan needs to happen, what sort of manual actions, what sort of automation actions we want to happen inside that recovery plan, what order we want those servers to come back online, and more. Is there any consistency around the recovery plan after it's been created? The question is, is there any, can you, can you clarify, like, consistency in what way? Okay, so I, I set it up six months later, I've changed uh, something in my subscription, I've changed the network name, uh, you know, the underlying <laughs> I 
So the question is, uh, after you configure your recovery plan, um, what happens if something in your network changes? What if six months later you change your networks, you change uh, IP range, et cetera? Is it going to notify you that you need to make an update to the recovery plan? Um, the recovery plan is going to coordinate how things happen and what the automation is, but the mapping to like your Azure networks happens on a VM by VM layer, on a protected item by protected item layer. So if you were to go in here and change your virtual networks out in Azure and you want to restore to virtual network B now, you would need to update that on the VMs, which you can do in bulk. Um, I don't think it would notify you uh, when you changed the virtual network itself, but when you hopped here, it would give you an alert saying that you need to attend to the configuration of the machines. And as to the automation you implement in your recovery plan, because that is entirely customizable, it doesn't know what you're configuring to do. It just knows that you're saying, go do thing. So that would be part of your plan. If you were to be undergoing a major network infrastructure overhaul, you want to make sure that part of that plan involved updating your disaster recovery plan. But because it can be edited at any time, it'll be a lot easy to, easy to, easier to just change the settings and point it to new place and go. So as far as setting this up on my servers that have replicated, it's a very simple install onto the Hyper-V host or onto the vSphere host. Uh, the vSphere slash physical server side is a bit more infrastructure to set up because it leverages a uh, replication server that you deploy to collect, process, compress the data, and shoot it up to Azure. Um, benefits of either, the vSphere slash physical server replication, that's going to support continuous replication of data. It's going to be constantly grabbing changes and sending them up to Azure as soon as they happen. On the Hyper-V side, it basically is an administrative layer sitting atop Hyper-V replica which means that uh, the replication is happening through a Hyper-V replica-based mechanism, and the replication frequency is going to be as little as 30 seconds. So on the Hyper-V side, you've got at most 30 seconds of data loss. Real world, that's not going to be that big of a deal, but in most situations. Obviously, in some situations, it could be. But that would be why we also want to separate our disaster recovery plan and our backup plan to do things like grabbing transactions. This does support app consistent snapshots, as you can see. If we were using this to replicate SQL servers out, it does hook into SQL Server so that you can collect all of the transactional data, make sure that we're getting a full replication of that app consistent snapshot when it does backups and replication. So over on the uh, VM here, we can hop into the Azure Backup agent itself and see how we can access the data we have backed up and easily restore it. So this could be a user's client. This could be uh, a key file server. But we're able to see our backups that have happened. We can also see the jobs, job history in the Azure portal. And we can see how many recovery points we have, all the data relative to that. If we wanted to recover that data, it's as simple as going into clicking the Recovery Data button and following the wizard to select the files folders we want and restoring it. I'm going to restore to this server, and I'm just going to browse for files. All the fun of selecting recovery points. I'm going to try and just quickly go through this. So I'm not using the instant restore capability here. This is just inside the wizard. But we can come in here and navigate through find the files that we want to back up or to restore, find the version of them based on the recovery point we selected, and then just select the items and recover them out to set them back where we need to go. When we recover them, we can recover to the same location or to a new location. So if you want to restore the old version and keep it side by side with the new version, you can do that. If you want to just overwrite what's there now with the backed up version, you can do that too. So hopping back to our presentation, here we go, cool. Did I leave my 
Now, moving on, we're going to talk about Azure Automation and DSC. Azure Automation and DSC, uh, as you guys are probably aware, if you're not aware, we here at Model Technology, we do a lot of automation. And so Azure Automation is pretty near and dear to our hearts. It's, it's fun. <laughs> um, when we talk about Azure Automation and DSC, what we're talking about is providing a heterogeneous process automation solution that enables you to take the work that you do today, take the standard tasks that you perform, and automate them in a easily, inter easily interactive way, whatever way works best for you, and set them up on a schedule. Um, the way this works, we're, because Azure Automation leverages, uh, right, let me start over here, lost my train of thought, my apologies. So uh, you already have lots of infrastructure in your environment, you already have different applications, you already have different components that all have different integration layers. Probably have a lot of PowerShell modules for each of those, or other APIs you can use to interact with them. Different programs have REST APIs, or PowerShell, or just other town calls that can be made to talk to them. With Azure Automation, we can interact with all of those. Additionally, with Azure Automation, doesn't matter where our workloads are at, whether they're in the cloud, whether they are on-prem, whether they are on Windows machines, Linux machines, etc. Azure Automation is built on PowerShell, which means that we have a lot of flexibility in how we handle everything. As you're already probably aware, PowerShell has been open sourced and .NET Core has been migrated over to Linux, which means PowerShell works on Linux, which means we can do interact our Linux boxes and Windows boxes in the same way. Because Azure Automation is built on PowerShell, anything we want to automate, any scripts we want to run that are going to interact with our Windows servers or our Linux servers or anything else can be done through this service. The automation engine itself is highly available. It's run through Azure. So you don't need to worry about uh, as much of an on-prem infrastructure for maintaining that high availability. Um, because it's got an entirely web-based console, you don't have to worry as much about different tools, different front ends for different tasks. You can just get in and do things all in one place. We can run runbooks in Azure if you're using Azure services, but like we're talking about, for your on-prem environment, we can stand up hybrid runbook workers on-prem, we're gonna talk more about those in a few minutes, that function as gateways into your environment from the cloud service that we can use to run any automation we want inside your existing environment. So one of the benefits of the automation engine is that we're able to reuse data in multiple runbooks, multiple workflows. Instead of doing something in something like Task Scheduler, where you're having to uh, either hard code data or have it run under specific credentials or any sort of access to network share to pull data, how are you doing it? We can plug a bunch of data into Azure Automation, store them as different types of assets, and work those into our automation so that we can leverage that data in multiple places. If you need to access, if you need uh, multiple types of automation to access your Exchange server or your make domain changes or whatnot, and you want to centrally manage the credentials that are used to facilitate that communication, we can do that by creating a credential asset. We even configure that credential asset into a connection if need be, and we can build that such that any runbook that needs it, don't have to put the creds in there. All we say is a little PowerShell command let get automation credential AD credentials. And that'll pull in the creds from the Azure Automation Service securely. We can't access, once they're stored, they're stored encrypted. You can't get the data back out. Um, once we use it, it just gets used. We don't have access to the runtime data. Um, obviously, somebody who has access to Azure Automation or any automation engine could write a malicious runbook that just extracted data and spat it out to a text file. But one of the benefits that Azure Automation brings is much more granular user control of its interface. You can make sure that people only have the access they need. If you need HR or somebody else to come out here and just run certain runbooks, you can configure it such that they literally only have access to run runbooks and only those certain runbooks. They won't even see anything else. So the administrators are the ones who have full control. You can easily prevent access for others. We have other types of data we can use. 
store PowerShell modules as assets, store uh, any sort of string, Boolean data as variable assets. We can schedule, we can create scheduling assets to schedule when our runbook should run. And part of that's also where they should run, whether they should run in Azure or on-prem via hybrid worker. And if we need certificates in order to facilitate communication with different services or whatnot, we can also store those natively in Azure Automation, securely in Azure Automation, so we can leverage those. Like I've mentioned before, it's an entirely web-based interface. Everything is done from the Azure portal. You can configure when things run, you can configure your assets, you can actually do all the scripting. It's got a relatively decent PowerShell editor right there in the browser. And it's not just PowerShell that you have to know, because this also supports graphical runbooks. So you can simply link together different commandlets, passing in a little bit of data here and there, but just logically linking the pictures of the images together, pictures of the commandlets together, to have it flow through the logic and perform that script, building a script programmatically, essentially. If you need to run things on-prem, we leverage what are called hybrid remote workers, which is, like I mentioned before, a little gateway that sits on-prem and functions as a gateway for the Azure Automation Service to reach into your environment. This is something that we can make highly available. We can put multiple runbook workers into a group. We can have them be balanced internally. Actually, the service balances entirely because all you have to do is stand up the runbook workers, and Azure will determine which jobs go to which, work, which worker in which order. And if a worker drops off connection, then those jobs get migrated to the, another worker, et cetera. So we can make sure that we are able to perform our automation highly available both in the cloud and on-prem. These workers are processes, not uh, VMs? There is recommended that you make a dedicated VM for it, but essentially it's just a little application that's installed on the server. Uh, honestly, it's the Microsoft monitoring agent itself. So if you're familiar with, every, uh, with log analytics or with SCOM, um, you know that SCOM and log analytics both share the Microsoft monitoring agent. We're going to talk more about that in particular in the log analytics section. But the hybrid workers actually leverage that same Microsoft monitoring agent as the tool that runs on-prem in order to facilitate the running of the workloads. Uh, when, you, when a runbook is triggered on a hybrid runbook worker, that gets downloaded to that hybrid uh, worker download to the Microsoft monitoring agent, which loads up the appropriate PowerShell run space and performs the actions. Um, technically speaking, any server, any computer you put the agent on could be a hybrid remote worker. It's recommended that you dedicate these just so we're not trying to do too much on a given server. We want to make sure that we're treating our servers as replaceable. And if it's running multiple tasks, then it'd be harder to do that. But if we just say, here's this tiny machine, it's got two cores, two gigs of RAM, and we're just going to let it run run books, then we're good to go. The sizing of those, two core, two gigs, is not an overall recommendation. It's just kind of the baseline. Um, but it really depends on what workloads you're running and how many workloads you're running, because when a workload runs, it gets loaded up into memory. So whatever machine you're having will need to be able to support with enough memory whatever job you're running. Um, but PowerShell is pretty lightweight, especially if you take care of the code as you clean, clean up what you're doing as you go in the code. So it's it, you don't need too many resources. So the, uh, those runbook workers serve as a central management function. I mean, if all your machines have SCOM monitoring agents on it, would you just deploy specific components to the servers where they would run, or you would still use a central resource to execute? So you'd want to use a dedicate. You want to use specific servers to be your hybrid remote workers. You wouldn't really want to turn them all into hybrid remote workers. Though we'll talk a little bit more about something related to that later. Um, the reality is, for Azure Automation, your, the recommendation is to have one, two, three hybrid servers that are dedicated as hybrid remote workers that you stand up on-prem, and that's all they do. You have to put them inside a group in Azure Automation hybrid remote worker group, and when you run your runbooks, you target the group, and that will, the service will automatically determine which of those machines should run the jobs. Some more information about those. Um, one of the big benefits, all network traffic happens over 443. It's all HTTPS. There's a few uh, specific URLs you need to have access to. 
on the Microsoft service side, but all the communication for Azure Automation is on 443, so it does not require major network changes. It's basically, does your server have internet access, or can it get access through a, through a proxy? So long as you have that, then the on-prem server requirements are met. Has model done any hybrid uh, first? How it structure that? So from like VMM into the my normal day-to-day -day operations is I, I operate theoretically three hybrid agents for my site, but on about two a.m. my workloads shift to automate. On-site of oh, oh, more hybrid remote workers. Of additional mm -hmm. workers to redistribute the load and then claw them back. So the question is, uh, have we done anything such as the dynamic provisioning of hybrid remote workers during certain time frames when needed, et cetera, for bursting, and then pull them back uh, at the end? Uh, I don't think we've actually done that yet, but we have done some bursting of other workloads. It wouldn't be terribly difficult to automate that. You'd just be integrating with your, uh, have some scripts that integrate with your uh, virtual, your hypervisor that are configured to run based on load, based on monitoring, which we could do via, collect that data via, via log analytics. Um, so that that's entirely doable. Uh, sounds like a fun thing to do. <laughs> so uh, other bits with Azure Automation. So I, I, I want to talk about comparing it versus Orchestrator on-prem. So I know we had a few hands in the room earlier about who uses Orchestrator today. I know I've used Orchestrator extensively myself. Um, I like Orchestrator. But I will say the more I've used Orchestrator, the more I've really enjoyed Azure Automation as a separate tool. Uh, because Azure Automation really spawned from Microsoft's desire to improve Orchestrator. Uh, many of you may know about Service Management Automation, which came on the System Center 2012 R2 Orchestrator disk as a secondary automation engine, as a PowerShell workflow-based automation engine. Uh, Azure Automation has spawned from as a cloud-based version of that, adding on additional features, additional interface. And in fact, the latest version of SMA is very similar to Azure Automation in terms of functionality, except there's no graphical front end. Um, Azure Automation solves that problem by using the Azure portal. But uh, Orchestrator is very handy, it's very useful. The graphical interface makes it very convenient and simple to spin up and build new automation. But it does have limitations to it, uh, some of those being the separate array of interfaces for it, the need to configure different things in different places, and the fact that user interfaces are not always the most friendly. Um, whereas Azure Automation, it's all done via the web, it's all HTML5, it's all very interactive and easy to use. Uh, they both have graphical authoring. Azure Automation's graphical authoring, or sorry, Workshare's graphical authoring is built around uh, these little, little activities from integration packs, which are essentially custom code built specifically for Orchestrator to integrate it with other products. And there's a number of those out there. There's a number of partners that have built integration packs for non-Microsoft workloads. But in my experience, whenever I've done a lot of automation with Orchestrator, I always end up doing just a bunch of PowerShell anyway. Um, a lot of the integration activities just aren't quite where I want them to be, and I just work around it with PowerShell. With Azure Automation, it's all PowerShell already. Even the graphical authoring, they're graphical objects that reflect and represent PowerShell commandlets. So you've got a lot more flexibility and a lot more capability there. Um, additionally, on the Orchestrator side, it supports PowerShell v2. Not exactly the most recent. There's a lot of fun we've had to do when making automation in Orchestrator that's involved working around the limitations of PowerShell v2. Whereas Azure Automation is built on PowerShell v5, uh, and it updates as you update, so as, as PowerShell updates. So you have full access to anything you want to do in PowerShell in Azure Automation. Additionally, because Azure Automation is built around PowerShell modules. Any PowerShell module out there, whether it is one that's from Microsoft, one that's from a third-party provider for their own custom application, PowerCLI, et cetera, or whether it's a custom module you built with a bunch of advanced functions in it, that all works in Azure Automation. You import that into the service, and bam, there you have it. 
So it's much more flexible, much more capable of integrating with and interacting with other systems with a lot less work. So we're going to look at that in more detail after talking about the other part of Azure Automation, which is DSC. How many of you in the room today are aware of what DSC is? Good number of hands. Cool. How many of you are using it in any capacity? Got a couple of hands. So for those who don't, Desired State Configuration is a new feature built into Windows as of 2012 with an improving with each release. And it's also available on Linux now that can be managed through here. Um, but what it is, the way it's a model of declaring configuration of servers in advance and then letting the server adjust itself to meet that configuration. This is really useful for things like configuring server roles and features, configuring uh, file structures, folder structures, re making registry changes, setting changes, anything else that you want to be the configuration of that server. Instead of having to manually do everything, you can write it all out in a, in a DSC configuration, which is a, just a bit of PowerShell, and apply that to the server. And the server will assess itself versus that configuration and make necessary changes, installing any roles, features, whatnot that the configuration says need to be there, removing any that the configuration says do not need to be there, configuring any registry settings, et cetera. Um, DSC is super powerful and super useful. It also helps you make sure it means a lot of benefits to it. Um, if you want to standardize your change management and know exactly what the configuration of servers are, DSC is great for that because you can declare what those servers should be. You can say specifically, here's the config. And then when you have your change meeting, if you have to make a change to that server, instead of going on to that server and changing a registry setting or changing uh, a file location or an application setting, you make that change inside the config. And inside your change meeting, you say, here's the old config, here's the new config, this is what our server looks like, bam. Making sure that everything's consistent. If that server dies, you need to spin up a new one, that's fine. You've got the configuration there, you supply it, and bam, now you have your server back. It's very flexible, very powerful, very useful. Um, do a, you can do a lot with DSC. Because it's all built around PowerShell as well, you can actually build your own resources. There's a lot of resources out there that are provided by Microsoft that can be used to easily configure different things via DSC. But if there's something you want to do on your server for which there's not a resource out there, or if you just want to change a resource, you can grab the existing code, it's all open source, you just customize it, tweak it, build your own, have your own custom resource that you can use in your environment or publish online or whatever you want to do to manage the configuration of your servers. DSC is super awesome. I, I can't really stress this enough. Um, one thing that DSC on its own is lacking, DSC is a framework. It's designed to be the tool that other tools interact with to, to configure the servers. Azure Automation DSC provides a management layer on top of DSC. It's not the only one. You can use other products to add that management layer as well. Uh, Chef does it and a few others. But Azure Automation DSC is going to give you features that those don't in terms of being built in and hooked in to all your other auto automation, giving you reporting about the compliance state of your DSC managed servers, and giving you the ability to build your configurations out online for the compilations, et cetera. It gives you centralized management of your configurations. And being a cloud-based pull server, a DSC pull server is basically a centralized server that contains your DSC configurations so that when your servers need to check whether or not their configuration has been <coughs> updated, they talk to that pull server, pull down the latest configuration, and apply it. You can also do it on a server-by-server -server basis, but that's a lot more work. The best practice is to set up a pull server of some kind Azure Automation gives you a pull server that's hosted in the cloud that's going to be always accessible so long as your servers have internet access either directly or via a proxy. And they can get out there, pull down configuration, and apply it. So we're going to take a look at what this looks like in Azure. If I'm out in the Azure portal, I can hop over to my Automation Account section. And inside here, I've got a number of test run books, I've got a number of DSC configurations. Well, I've got one configuration, I've got applied to six nodes. But uh, 
From here, we can see right away what the statistics are for our automation jobs we have running. This is going to be our jobs that have run on-prem and our jobs that have run in the cloud. Just quick access to our job status. Um, I mentioned that everything can be controlled out here. You can go and look at all the individual jobs that have ran. I actually haven't done any much on this instance. But if you go to the run books, like I mentioned before, this is, it's just PowerShell. We can go into an individual run book and see when it's scheduled to run, what the ways are to interact with it, what past job history has been. We can also go in and configure what happens with it. This is a graphical run book. This one, we can see that it's pretty straightforward. This one itself is about resetting a user password in Active Directory. And it's directly talking to Azure AD for this case, but this can work just as easily on prep. You can see, if I zoom in, that what's happening is quite st straightforward. We're just getting our AD credentials out of a credential asset stored in Azure Automation, using that to authenticate with the Azure AD service, retrieving the user, resetting their password, and then making a change to an Office 365 run book. This is one example. We can easily build these for whatever we have to have happen. We can put logic on the links. We can put different link paths and have it take different routes based on what's happened. Um, at any given piece, we can take a look at what the configuration is for it. If I go into the edit mode, we can configure that, configure how it handles errors, configure parameters, configure optional stuff, configure retry behavior. We can configure the links. We can move objects around and set up new links. And it's as simple as that to use. We just drop in our commandlets, drop in our uh, actions that we want to have happen. Say I want to do an add Azure account bit. Just add that in and link it up in whatever way makes sense. Set the settings on it and go. Very easy to configure these. Very powerful. You can test it from here. You can configure inputs and outputs. I'm going to unsave that. And I'll hop over to another runbook. This one is a uh, PowerShell-based runbook. This is one that I use for deploying agents in Scout. If we hop into that, it's got a nice giant comment block at the top. But this is all just standard PowerShell. We can come in here and edit it however we want. Save that and go. Again, you can test it from here, get, in, get output, get info on what's happening, all from the portal. So that's very powerful, very useful. You can look at job history for the individual jobs. I've not actually run it in my demo environment here. Again, we can also go into our DSC configurations. So I've got six servers being managed by my DSC environment right now. As you can see, three of them are compliant and three are currently in a pending state. We can click on them and see what the current progress is. This one's actually currently uh, running a consistency check. If we go into any of the checks, we can get detailed information about how long it took to apply, what it got out of it. We see a list of the DSC resources that are involved in that configuration, which the resources are just the, the blocks of pre-configured configuration that uh, tells DSC how to do certain actions. So the configurations that I have applied to these DCs right now, or to these uh, servers right now, is pretty straightforward. I'll pull it up from the compilation job just to show you what it looks like. Don't know uh, how easy it'll be to read it. But um, what I'm doing in this configuration is the intent of this configuration is to deploy the Microsoft Monitoring Agent, the latest version from, the, from Azure, and the Dependency Agent for Log Analytics to each server and connect them out to my Log Analytics workspace. We're going to see that in Log Analytics in the next section. But what I'm doing here is just basically making sure that all my servers that I'm managing are being monitored and talking out to Log Analytics. And if they aren't, then I'm able to have themselves auto-correct that to make sure that they are continuing to talk to my monitoring service. In here, I'm just defining how to install it, how to, where to get the files from, et cetera. And once it does all that, once I apply that to the nodes, I can go into them, look at their status, 
and have it tell me right away, this is my configuration that's talking out, that's telling the health service on those machines to talk to my login Linux workspace. And I can tell you it's happy. I can tell you it is uh, compliant with the policy I've configured. Um, so I know right away that this is working and it's maintained that configuration. If we were to go and change that configuration and push it back out, we could watch as the server writes itself next time it resolves the configuration. If we were to go out there and turn off the service, next time this ran, it would scan and say it's not compliant because the service is not uh, turned on. It'll restart that service and get it back to being compliant. Centralized management of server configuration, all from the cloud. So when we build those, well, the hybrid runbook worker groups I mentioned, we can loop our hybrid workers into groups that we assign tasks to so that they get farmed out across the nodes appropriately. You can see I've got one group out here. It's got one worker in it. And right now, everything is nice and healthy on that server. You can do additional configuration on those. We can configure, um, by default, the hybrid remote workers will run under the local system account of the servers they run on. But if you need your workers to run as specific credentials, we can save those credentials here in Azure Automation as a credential asset and apply those to the runbook workers so that they run under those credentials. If we want specific runbooks to run under certain credentials, right now we have to configure those runbooks with the credentials in them. We can't configure individual runbooks yet. That feature is certainly coming. Um, if we go into assets, it's like we saw before. We can easily see what PowerShell modules we have in the environment, what version of them are out there. We can configure variables with information. For example, this is the workspace key for my Azure Automation workspace. This is what my DSC configuration is downloading to tell those servers, talk to the log analytics, here's where you talk to it, here's how to secure your communications. I want those to be available, so I have those stored in variables, but I don't want just anybody to be able to go out here and take a look at that data. So I have them encrypted, so we can't access that. If we wanted to edit it, it would just clear out the old data. We wouldn't be able to retain it. So that makes sure that our data is secure. When you say, when you say a uh, question around uh, features for credential change functions, can you clarify what you mean by change? Like, do you mean inside a script, or do you mean uh, changing it via the script, or, or what are you what are you referring to exactly? Well, you associate those credentials, regardless of like script, uh, in multiple places, and hopefully you buy all. Okay, so but the question is, can you if change? I created a monster of architectures. How do I do that without growing my operations? Gotcha. So the question is, how do we easily change our credential value without breaking what's out there? And my answer to that is actually really simple. When we configure what credentials are used by runbooks, if you're creating a new credential out here, let me come in here and make a new credential. Instead of naming this the username, I would just say this is my AD connection account or whatever, whatever the specifics are there. And then the username and password would be the specific user credentials. If I needed to change that, all you have to do is update it in this one place and any runbook that's using those credentials would then be using the updated credentials. You can automate that as well. If you're using some sort of password <laughs> safe or an other system, you can update the value of these credentials via PowerShell. So if you needed to, you could build a script that updated the credentials inside your password safe, inside your domain, and updated them here in one fell swoop. And once they're updated in the credential object itself, any runbook that's retrieving those credentials are going to retrieve the new credentials. 
The only, the only time that it won't is if they've already pulled the credentials and they're starting to execute. Yeah, I mean, if a workflow is currently in process. It could be a timing issue, and I know your your is pretty large, so you probably run into some other issues. Oh, sure. Doing operations at the point where we're doing space, that is a distinctive challenge. Yes. Right? No matter what tool you use. It doesn't matter. How to handle that? A whole too. window of processing that is in the impact zone. Now. Well, off the top of my head, the first idea that comes into mind to how to deal with the uh, effects of the window would be inside your scripts when they configure that those credentials. I would actually leverage two sets of credentials that that you would your process for when to change your passwords would be offset. And inside the scripts, whether it's a graphical runbook or a PowerShell, you'd simply have it load the first one, attempt to validate it. If the credentials pass, use it. If not, use the other one. That way, right away, it's going to say, can I use these creds? Yes, no. If not, you've got a backup in place. You can stagger when those passwords are changed to avoid any windows. And you wouldn't have to worry about modifying your own books beyond the beginning. You know, a second service account, but if they're both secure, uh, secured, sec secured securely um, in your in here in Azure, as well as your password vault, AD, etc., that wouldn't necessarily be a deal breaker, depending on your auditing requirements. So and that that's literally a five second thought. So I, there could be more detail. Yeah, more people, but they still have that operational gap. Yeah. So that's Azure Automation in a nutshell. Um, if you're doing more stuff with Azure services and whatnot, if you want your other applications, custom applications, integrate directly with Azure Automation, you can do that. Any runbook can be configured to have a webhook published. A webhook just being a URL that is exposed that can be used to trigger the runbook so long as authentication data and specific formatted uh, in, invocation data gets passed to it, which you can then distribute to your app developers and say, hey, when you want to do this thing, we've got the code in the runbook, just trigger this code and go. Um, other, so other applications, some applications support sending webhooks. So depending on what you're using for your HR platform or whatnot, it may have the capability to shoot out and target a webhook, in which case you could configure integration between that and Azure Automation natively. Um, but if you don't have any of that and you just want to run run, run books on premises, then all you need to do is stand up a hybrid worker or two and build out your run books here and go. That's easy to get started. If you are using Task Scheduler or Orchestrator today, it's easy to migrate. Task Scheduler, you already have a bunch of scripts. All you have to do is make sure they're PowerShell, drop them in here, and go. Or if it's a batch script or something, wrap it in PowerShell. Though it would be a good opportunity to convert it to PowerShell. Um, if you're using Orchestrator, there is a migration tool set that exists to convert Orchestrator runbooks into Azure Automation Runbooks. Um, it's from Microsoft. It's officially a beta, but it's been around for a few years now. Um, I've had reasonable luck with it. I've not used it myself too, too much because I usually just start over from scratch. But I have some people I trust who have used it extensively and have said good things. So if you have a significant orchestrator investment today, you can fairly easily lift that up to Azure Automation without too many problems. All right. It's about 10.30, so we should hop into log analytics, into the fun part. Not that this stuff hasn't been fun, but log analytics is my favorite part. You say you could talk about log analytics for hours. I could, but we're not going to talk about it for too, too long, maybe. Not hours, plural. Um, so log analytics, like I mentioned at the start, log analytics covers two different pillars of the OMS promise, insight and analytics and security and compliance. Log Analytics is a very large solution. There's a lot of stuff going on in it, there's a lot to talk about, but it's at the same time very easy to use. Um, let's talk about data challenges in your environment today. 
we all have a lot of servers, a lot of applications that create a lot of data. We've got application logs, we've got system event logs, we've got uh, performance counters, this, that. We've got auditing information. There is data everywhere. And figuring out how to deal with that data can be a challenge. Traditionally, we've got different monitoring platforms for different services. You might be using Operations Manager or What's Up Gold or some or uh, uh, I totally forgot the name of it, SolarWinds, to be monitoring your servers up, down, etc. Then you're using something else to monitor your network, and maybe you're using something else entirely for security, etc., etc., etc. You got a lot of data, and because you're interacting with it in a lot of different tools, you don't have a lot of interaction between that, and it can be harder to see how different pieces connect. So we can solve that by bringing it all into one tool. And that's the goal of log analytics. We're talking about collecting data from numerous data sources, pulling it all into a standardized interface that we can interact with in a consistent manner, but get data about and analyze data about all manner of information in our IT operations environment. So I'm going to. Log Analytics is capable of a number of things and provides it in a single bit dashboard, single pane of control. Um, you can use your existing solutions if you want. If you've got SCOM today, you've got Nagios or Zabbix, Log Analytics can integrate with those. You can grab the alert data that you're getting in those services and pump it up to Log Analytics for consistent processing there. If you've got... Um, well, array of tools. Um, you can use, you can interact with it via the web, via your phone, via whatever. It's all HTML5 based. Uh, it's moving to. There's a few different older solutions that still have sort of like components. They're on their way out. Um, you, instead of having to navigate through a bunch of different tools and through a console here and a client there and a website there, it's all in one place. It's one portal for all of your monitoring needs. It collects a ton of data. Uh, this is just some of the on-prem data we're able to collect. Uh, it's going to grab all of your Windows event logs, performance counters on both Windows and Linux. It's going to grab IIS data, syslog data, text-based log files, uh, custom log files, anything else that you can send to it. It's got a whole API exposed. All of your Azure services, if you're using those, can hook into it. If you are doing some sort of custom application, you can configure that to hook straight into Log Analytics. You can build a PowerShell script to grab data out of some third-party application and spit it up into Log Analytics. It will take your data wherever your data is coming from. We're able to get it all into one place and interact with it all in the same way to get easier access to insights. Speaking of insights, the thing that I think is best about Log Analytics is its solutions. Log Analytics is built around a series of solutions, and they're coming up with more of these all the time, that essentially what they are is turnkey or mostly turnkey sets of configuration. You just got to set it, turn it on. Some of them require a minor bit of configuration. For example, some of the network ones require you to make sure that certain network ports are open so that the fire, the uh, traffic can actually go to monitor your network. But in general, you just turn them on. And once you turn them on, they start collecting the data they need for that solution. And once they start collecting that data, once they get that data into the system, machine logic on the back end assesses that data, structures it all consistently, and presents it to you in easy to use forms. The solutions are filled with dashboards and, and uh, additional data. We've got assessment data in there that's going to look for predictable issues in the environment, things that we have information about due to Microsoft's security business and Microsoft's uh, support business and all of that all knowledge articles, all that knowledge they have is able to be exposed to you automatically by having these solutions read the data that they're pulling in from your environment, apply that pre-built knowledge, apply that pre-learned knowledge, apply that machine learning on the back end, and point out to you things that you should notice, things that you need to care about. I love Operations Manager. It's great. But the one problem that I have had with Operations Manager, when I talk with clients, everybody basically agrees it's noisy. You get a lot of data. It's to the point where it's more data than you can really deal with. 
and it's telling you, here's an alert, here's an alert, there's an alert, but it doesn't tell you necessarily why it's a problem in your infrastructure. Log Analytics goes a step beyond that. We get a lot more data, but it's not only incredibly easier to navigate and to analyze and assess, but it skips a step and not just provides you with the data, but it tells you why this data is important and things that you can proactively do to address your environment today. So I mentioned it's easy to search to find the data. It's backed by a powerful and intuitive log search engine. Everything that Log Analytics does on the back end is built around this log search engine. Every dashboard that comes with it, every dashboard you build is all built around searches and ways of visualizing the data that you have. It's very easy to use. Very, it guides you through the process of finding the data. There's a graphical query builder, got a picture up here of part of it, that allows you to easily look at the way the data you currently are receiving is broken down and filter through that. It enables you to find different properties that you can filter on and easily uh, splice the data you have, slice the data you have to find the information you're looking for and get the results you want. The solutions have a dozens of pre-built queries built into each of them. Uh, if you go into just a fresh log analytics uh, environment, install a few solutions and just go into the saved searches that are already there, you're going to see more than 100. There's a lot of them. Uh, and then you can always build your own and save them for later use. Additionally, because unlike something like Operations Manager where, where configuration is in a separate management pack, um, and if you want to use a, a management pack developed by that person over there for that company, you've got to grab it and then make tweaks for your environment and bring it in. If somebody posts a query online to get data out of Log Analytics, for you to use that query, all you do is copy and paste. Bam. It's an entirely text-based based log search, so there's no need for complex configuration. I mentioned building custom dashboards. This is one we have in the demo environment that I'll show you in a bit. Um, the solutions provide pre-built dashboards, but you can also build your own, and it's easy to do that. If you have data, if, you, if you're pulling in data, you have stuff you need to see, you can build queries to express that data, drop into these dashboard tiles, and right away you can expose this data out to people who need to see it. If you need to have a dashboard for your help desk or your support teams to know what the uptime is on different servers or to know whether things are down or having problems or this, that, the next thing, we can build that dashboard or use one that's already there, easily fill it out and go. Additionally, these dashboards are uh, uh, essentially um, defined in ARM templates, if you're familiar with what, what those are. It's an Azure configuration text bit essentially just a bunch of JSON, which means that once you configure one of these, you can export it. You can import it somewhere else, to another work, workspace. If you have a prod environment and a dev environment, moving configuration between them, super kick, super easy. If you want to borrow a solution that somebody publishes online, just import the solution. Um, there, Microsoft has also talked about how the long-term plan is to allow partners and others to uh, publish official solutions in the official solution gallery. So you can easily just add them from there. Uh, right now, the solution gallery is just Microsoft solutions, but it's got, I don't know, 30 or 40 different solutions in there with more constantly in development. It's a lot of stuff to do right out the gate without requiring much investment in your part. Most of the time, you just turn it on and go. Um, Alert management, it has as well. Uh, unlike other products where you have to go through a complex wizard to fill out an alert, we've got one page. Basically, you make your query, and then you just convert any query into alert, just simply adding how often you want it to run the query, what threshold it's looking for, and what it should do afterwards. Whether that is send an email, or invoke an Azure Automation Runbook to perform remediation, or send a webhook to your uh, to your uh, IM tool or your ticketing system or whatever to send a ticket, create a ticket, do things, notify someone. One of the things that I like about alert management in uh, 
log analytics is alert storms are not really a thing. If you look at something like Operations Manager, where one server goes down, you get a whole bunch of alerts about uh, uh, that, or a process runs wild, you get a whole bunch of, of alerts about CPU performance, etc. A bunch of servers go down because the network link goes down. There's a little mess built around the query. So you can have that query set up such that it's going to grab all that data and throw, it, throw you one email with all that information in it. Instead of getting 20 emails that your entire site is down, you got one for each server, you get one email that says, hey, our, our available server's alert has gone off. Here are 20 servers that are currently offline. Please go adjust them. Much easier on your email inbox, much easier on you, much easier to see the issues that are happening that you need to address. So I mentioned automatic remediation. There's direct integration with Azure Automation. When you're configuring an alert, any given alert, you can link directly to an Azure Automation runbook. You can configure that runbook to import the data from the alert so you know what server has the problem or how many servers or whatever other information is in that alert. And then have that automation runbook remediate that or perform any other action you need. And this is all stuff that falls on the insight and analytics side. We go to the security side and we're talking about what log analytics can do for you from a security perspective. Like I mentioned before, it grabs a lot of data. And question? On that particular topic, how, uh, within your Azure subscription, what billable component contains log analytics? Gotcha. Question is about, about billing for log analytics. So that goes into your log analytics workspace. And as far as the licensing for that goes, there are basically two tiers for that right now. Well, three tiers. There's a free tier that's based around a small amount of data that's used for testing or whatnot. But there is a basic tier that is a consumption-based tier where you're paying based amount of data you're bringing in. And in those situations, you want to use that for situations where you're only bringing in a little bit of data for small servers just to uh, solve one specific problem. Based but on your total aggregate data for this, for a month. Um, but if you're if you're going for, if you really want to go all in, the best bet is to use the OMS tier, which is a node-based uh, service, uh, not including any discounts or anything else you might get. Um, the base price is ten dollars per node, and that gives you unlimited data in Azure Automation. Um, sorry, unlimited data in Log Analytics along with unlimited minutes in Azure Automation and uh, DSC configuration, all of that rolled together, access to some of the more advanced solutions in log analytics, um, and that comes with one month data retention. If you want to have more than one month data retention, you can extend that out, and beyond that one month, there's a consumption-based cost for the additional data retention. But if you're just talking, we want to pull in the data for right now, one month at a time, then it's 10, 10 bucks a node minus your discounts. Uh, it becomes very cost effective because it's a flat price that that price gives you all the log analytics assessments, all of the uh, security monitoring, all of the everything that log analytics has, plus any Azure automation you want, DSC built into it. It's all right. The only thing that's not included in the OMS licensing cost is the production recovery, Azure backup, Azure site recovery side of things. But the rest of OMS, there is like a one one license per server go and you're good. Okay. I mean, it, uh, does it have a, if you're maintaining historical data, does it have an incremental uh, collapsing of data over time? Are you familiar with Splunk? I am familiar with Splunk, yes. Okay. So like your indexers will compress your oldest data and summarize them and thereby reduce your total storage. So as far as uh, log analytics goes, the question is with Splunk, when you have data in there over a long period of time, Splunk will index and compress the data so that you're reducing storage. And if I recall correctly, it also means you're, you're losing some of the fidelity of the data as well, right? You're what? Losing some of the fidelity of the data because it's being... Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah. have, you, you would lose your whatever you... You would lose minute by minute and collapse yeah. to hour, to day, to week, or whatever. With log analytics, uh, the retention, the way it's configured right now is consumption-based for cost, and that data is kept 
untouched, fully hot, ready for you to do whatever you want with. Um, the data is compressed on the back end, but it's not flattened. You don't lose any fidelity. You don't lose any detail. All the records are still there. So if you wanted to look at CPU performance trend across an entire year, and you had a year's worth of data in there, you'd have to pay for the 11 months beyond your, your node cost. Um, but that would all be there and available and accessible. When you search through it, when you do your queries, you have the ability to apply aggregations at query time. So the data is all kept fully open, available for you. And when you do your queries, you can aggregate it any way you want in a per minute, per hour, per whatever time frame. Um, so you get as much or as little detail as you want. You would not lose any data. So this can be very important with the security side of things because one of the solutions in, operation, in log analytics is what's called security and audit. It is one solution that's really made up of nine or 10 solutions. It's giant. It covers everything. We're going to go into a deep dive in it later, but I'm going to also show it off here in a minute. But this gives this is like a single place to go to fully assess the security footprint, security stance of your entire environment. Um, it is fantastic for both security and auditing. It's going to work across all your domains. Everything that's being pulled into log analytics, we can assess in the same way. This is a picture of part of the dashboard. We can see in the highlighted box in the corner, there is a bunch of uh, bunch of components to it. Um, there's also some notable issues area and some graphical map area, which we'll talk about in more detail in a minute. Um, this notable issues area, one of the things that this solution does is it has a number of built-in key issues to look for and notify you about in your environment. This is all based on the uh, knowledge articles that Microsoft produced, all security information, customer uh, feedback. Every source that Microsoft has for assessing security gets plugged into here through the machine data. So they will tell you if there are key things that you need to look for in your environment and address. And it ranks them by critical warning low priority. You can also configure your own. If there are things that are unique to your environment or things that you care about, that your security team cares about, that you need to see if it's, if it's a notable issue to you, you can define a query for it and save it so that it shows up in the same list and will notify you just the same way. Um, one other thing is in here is a baseline assessment of baseline security on your computers. I'm going to show you this in a few minutes. It's uh, one of the more recently added in parts, but it is basically a security best practice analyzer on, on speed. Um, all the machines that you have being monitored is going to run the workflows, and determine the baseline security, what needs to be adjusted, what are the best practices that are not being adhered to, what sort of holes might you have that you might not otherwise know about. And it's going to bring that directly to your attention so you can address those issues right away. There's over 180 configurations of best practices uh, in there today. More are always being added. And it doesn't just tell you it's a thing. It also provides information about why it's a thing and what to do about it. So we also have a whole lot of detailed login activity monitoring in here so we can easily see if we have uh, unusual behavior of accounts. We can easily see who's locked out, who's been blocked, who's been locked out frequently. Do we have, uh, what are the reasons accounts are being locked out? We have a lot of logins happening that we don't usually have. We can see information over time. Um, it's all right there, easy to find dashboards. You don't have to configure this. It's just, it's just there. You turn it on, it's good. So that's one of the biggest and best things about it is that this is not something that requires a whole lot of setup. You just enable a solution it starts running, you start getting value immediately. So let's hop over to Log Analytics and take a look at some of this. So Log Analytics, you can access through the Azure portal. You can actually access most of the solutions, the log search and whatnot, either through the Azure portal or through the dedicated OMS portal. Um, Work is being done. One of the things the OMS team is doing is moving everything to the Azure portal here so that the entire configuration, everything can be here, which will grant more powerful user-based, user role-based user access to Azure to log analytics than there is out of the box or at the OMS portal. 
But for right now, I'm happy to do a mess portal. It's the sort of classic look, but it just you, you have access to everything. There are some settings today that can only be done in the classic portal. There are some that you can do in the new portal. Um, it's a work in progress, but it is awesome. So we're going to pull up, and the first thing we see is our dashboard view here. I'm going to zoom in some so we can just get a better view out there on the screen. What we're looking at is a bunch of tiles that give quick access to information about different solutions we have out there. You can see that I've got an assessment to my Active Directory environment. I've got alert information, which is going to cover both alerts that are generated by Log Analytics and alerts that are brought in from other sources, be it SCOM, Zabbix, Nagios, etc. cetera. Uh, we've got a network performance monitor, a SCOM assessment. Um, there's a lot of these. I'm going to run through them, but I'm going to kind of show you some of the, the biggest ones. We have things like the AD assessment. There are several assessments that are in here. There's an AD assessment, a SQL assessment, more, that, that uh, analyze your environment and give you quick access to information and reasons for changes you can make to make things better. So in the AD one here, you can see on security and compliance, things are looking great. Uh, availability, business continuity, We've got one recommendation, et cetera. This environment that I'm pulling all this data from, by the way, is a demo environment that we just stood up. This is, this is for the most part, just raw, Windows configuration. Nothing special has been done on most of these servers that I'm pulling the information from. We can go down to the SQL assessment. That's going to have some more high, pri high priority ones. And we can see right away that uh, there are some highly weighted <laughs> recommendations. Passwords are the same as the login. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Uh, so apparently I've got some passwords out there that uh, have the same password as a login name. That's not good. It tells me right away. So <laughs> I can see that on my CM server. Um, I don't know. I think it was you. <laughs> but we can see right away uh, uh, not just what the problem is, but where it's happening, what the impact is, and how to fix it. <laughs> Catastrophic impact. Good job, Jason. <laughs> we can go back out here and see that we don't have full backups scheduled. We uh, are not optimizing our backup strategy using Azure Blob Storage, which, by the way, is related to the Azure Backup Service. They're not 100% the same, but the SQL Backup to Azure is related. Um, we can see all sorts of information that it just gives us immediate recommendations on things we can do to improve our SQL servers or AD or whatever. Like right here, it's telling me, hey, here is prioritized recommendations for how to optimize my SQL performance on these instances. And we can see that it's actually a number of SQL instances that could use this attention. So I didn't do anything special to get this information. All I did was turn on the assessment and I start getting this information. Other fun bits out here, we can go into the network performance monitor, which is, this is a currently in preview, but this is one that, I don't want to do that right now, no. Um, this is a solution that allows us to assess the performance of our network, assessing how fast traffic is traveling over the different links and uh, whether I have any network problems. This one has a small amount of configuration, which really just amounts to telling Azure Automation, or sorry, Log Analytics, um, what networks are connected to which ones, how it should be testing the connections. And once we do that, we get a whole lot of data here. I'm going to zoom back out a little bit so I can see a bit more at a time. But we can see that a, su a summary of our current network, I only have a few servers reporting, so there's not a whole lot of data, but we see that four networks out here, number of links. Nothing is unhealthy right now. That's good. It's handy. Um, we can see which subnetworks have the most loss and most latency. Um, things are looking pretty good, actually. Most loss is 0%. Can't complain about that. The uh, most latency is 0.98, so that's not bad. And most of these solutions are going to have a tile like this with a bunch of queries you can use to easily see a lot of other information as well. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time digging into how 
the log search works today. It will be a future deep dive on that. But we can click on that query and hop into the log search area, and it's going to pull up all the records it found for that. Apparently, it found no records for that search. I chose a good one to click on. Um, <laughs> let's just go into some of the network links and look at their health. We can go into our network links page. It's going to load up data. Now we've got immediate performance information about that. This page is not zooming well, so I'm going to change that scroll. We can adjust the amount of days, change it down to one at six hours, and see, watch that data over time, the latency we're getting and more for that network link. We go to sub network links. We can click and go to node links. You can just really drill into information and see how everything is talking and even see how individual servers are talking to other individual servers. So a lot of network information right out of the box. This solution just requires that the servers have uh, certain firewalls, fall, uh, firewall ports opened, certain ports open on the firewall. Um, some other fun ones, let me go back to update management. I've got a, this is a custom dashboard that I built. It's actually based off of one that you can find off online, but I made some tweaks to it. Um, but this is giving us a quick, just a quick overview of our server performance in the environment. We're going to see that we've got nine computers currently sending performance data out here to my uh, log analytics platform. We're going to see how many records are there. But uh, here is process utilization over time. Currently, time is configured for this time range. I can make it the last one day, and we'll see time change based on that. This graph, I think I might need to tweak. Oh, there it goes. See what the data we have for that time period. And these are going to be, these queries down here are basically top end. So I can see which ones have the highest percent CPU utilization, the highest or lowest percent free space, et cetera, right off the bat without having to drill in. I'm able to configure thresholds on these views so that I can easily see what is at a critical state versus a warning state versus a healthy state. That's all defined inside the dashboard. And any one of these we can drill into to get more information about it. So here's a nice uh, bar graph of this server over the last one day of its free space. I'll go to the CPU, it'll be a little bit more interesting. So we can see a breakdown of, uh, for all these servers, where the CPU uh, strengths and weaknesses have been. We can hide and uh, show different servers to see their impact on the whole thing. A lot of information we can get and visualize really easily. And then there's the security and audit solution. Actually, I'm going to have a service map in a few minutes, but uh, security and audit is really cool. So um, there's a number of uh, capabilities that are being added onto this all the time. But we can see right now in my environment, I've got some critical uh, issues where servers are missing security updates or servers have that so SQL assessment issues we're seeing. Accounts have failed to log in. Log on is the clear text password. This is something that security teams usually like to know about, whether log ons are being sent over the network in a clear text password. This is just notifying us right away without any special configuration that this is happening. We can see exactly which account is having the problem. We can drill into it further and see which servers these are being collected on. So quick access to that information, that clear text access passwords are being used. We can see that apparently there was an RDP brute force attack that was performed against one of our servers that failed. So that's really useful to know about. Apparently we, uh, our cloud domain controller has been attacked. So this not only provides information about the attack that it detected, but it's giving us information about how to remediate, what we need to do to address the problem and make it not a problem in the future. We can always go to the individual records as well. Oops, let me go back to the security audit main page. We also have this threat intelligence section, which is fun. Right now, our network is pretty good. It's showing no threats detected. You may have noticed in one of the screenshots in the presentation that it actually showed different markers on this page. What happens is one of the things the solution does is it performs uh, geolocation of servers based on IP addresses, so it knows where things are at in the world. And 
one of the things it monitors for is communications to or from known malicious IP addresses. Basically, this is gonna, this, this provides you immediate access to know, is a botnet attacking your network or are any servers on your network part of a botnet? Are they communicating with, communicating with malicious IPs? It's gonna give you quick access to which servers are affected, where that traffic is coming from, and how to address it. Very useful for a number of clients. Then we have all the sub, the sub solutions. So this is gonna link into your anti-malware uh, software you have on your computers. Um, they actually just recently updated this so that any anti-malware solution that integrates in or has APIs that work with the Windows Security Center uh, are going to hook into this. So if we're using McAfee or Norton or uh, Windows or whatever you're using, we'll be able to get access to that information in here and see what's being used, what's not being protected well enough, if we have any threats, etc. all in one pane of glass. We can see servers that are missing updates, how many computers. Note that right now I only have Windows computers reporting, but if we have Linux being monitored, then that could connect in here too. I should actually note, I don't think I called this out during the presentation, during this, this slideshow. There is, on, on the Windows side, this leverages the Microsoft monitoring agent. You can connect the servers directly to Log Analytics, or you can have the servers connect to SCOM and have SCOM connect to Log Analytics. So if you have a SCOM investment environment today, you can just basically pick that up and connect it to OMS and start getting all this data without having to do any deployments or configurations on your servers. And as far as Linux goes, there is an open source agent for Linux, for OMS, that Microsoft has been building and continues to build. It's based on FluentD, uh, but it is a standalone agent that can be deployed on a whole host of versions of Linux that we can have talked to here talk through a gateway to here to get that information. We can use those as syslog forwarders. There's actually a solution in here today in preview for vSphere monitoring, for ESX monitoring, that the way that works is you set up one or more vSphere, or sorry, Linux servers with the, with the OMS agent that are configured to act as uh, syslog forwarders. And you have your vSphere servers, your hosts, point their syslog data at those uh, forwarders all that data comes up to Log Analytics, and we get instant information about the performance of our vSphere environment. Um, very straightforward to use, very easy, very useful. Given how many times I've talked with customers about uh, vSphere monitoring and SCOM, and the need for third-party add-ons, uh, it's something that I think is pretty awesome that we have built-in support for vSphere. But yeah, on the update side, we can see how many updates are missing on servers? How many needs critical updates, security updates, other updates? We can view all this data. And there's a new functionality built into this um, that enables you to actually manage update deployments from here, scheduling updates and pushing out updates from this portal. Um, What's your source of authority for the available updates? As far as the Windows side, it uses whatever uh, source you're using on those computers, be it WSUS, SCCM, or straight out to Microsoft Update. On the Linux side, I don't know off the top of my head what the source of authority is for updates. Um, but if you enable the update deployment functionality through here, going back to something we mentioned back in the Azure Automation section, what it essentially does, it turns each of your monitored servers <laughs> into a hybrid runbook worker that is capable only of running runbooks distributed by this solution, which it then uses to self-patch those servers. So that's a fun new add-on if you want one way to do cloud-based uh, updates on an individual server-by-server -server basis. Other things, I mentioned the baseline assessment. Let me just scroll the window down some. We can go into the baseline assessment. And I've done nothing here. This is, this is raw servers. And we're seeing right away some very critical uh, baseline rules that have failed. We can see how many rules have been applied to different servers and how many have passed, what the average pass is. So right now, the baseline assessment of security in my demo environment is less than half 
I might want to tweak that. But this tells me this right away. These are things that I may not have even known I needed to address. That's telling me right away, here are some ways that we can optimize security in our environment. What options are now available with being able to lock data with data or extend through the terms of legal hold? I have, you want to use security because you're always going to use the first thing. I have a, a security event that occurred. Mm -hmm. Generally today, I have to lock the name somehow. Mm -hmm. It has to go into a legal hold, is what you're saying? But the equivalent there, uh, the equivalent yeah. of legal hold. So there's a question about uh, what options are in place today for when in situations where you need to lock data for compliance, legal hold, et cetera. Um, right now, I believe the only way to do that is just making sure your data retention is that far out in advance to hold it as long as you need. I do not know for certain if there are any other options in there today. I can check on that and get back to you. But I believe the solution is simply have the data retention put out long enough that you're able to retain the data. Retention. Yeah, okay. so that gets you the data, but that's not the same. Thing. Your other question is being able to run a report at a point in time, a snapshot. Correct, but typically when you're in a legal hold situation, mm -hmm. you have to be able to so, actual data itself in a legal context. And that one other way to do it? It's different than just having the data. Well, one way, another way you could probably do it actually. Right. So you're able inside here to export data. Um, so you can export that data to a CSV, Excel spreadsheet, whatnot, and lock that file down by whatever means you're doing today. But you can export data for long-term retention on your own. And we've also, I've got the question captured. It makes it very easy to, to, to capture data for auditing. So if we were to, say, go into identity and access. Yes. Um, do we have, are they still the providing As far as how much data and analytics mm -hmm. always has a yin and a yang, mm -hmm. yeah, right? The more data you get, the better your analytics. However, the cost to get the data. You're talking about resource cost, right? The cost it's to primarily around resource cost. So we've got a question about resource cost and how much it actually costs to get this data. This is actually one of the things that that makes blog analytics a huge improvement over Scott and other solutions. Uh, so again, this uses the same agent as SCAM on your servers. But there's a big difference in the resource footprint of Log Analytics versus the resource footprint of SCAM. Um, if you have SCAM today, you're probably already aware that the agent itself, except for when the server is having a major ish impact or issue, the server itself does not, is not usually affected by the SCAM agent. That's pretty lightweight. But the way that the SCAM agent works is these workflows that do all the collection and whatnot actually perform all data transformation and calculations and whatnot on that agent and shoot it back to the SCAM server. With log analytics, the footprint is reduced significantly because all it does is runs the workflow to collect the data, compresses it, and shoots it off. And all of the assessment, all of the calculations, the processing, everything is done on the back end in Azure so that it has a, the smallest footprint as possible on your local server. Um, in the tests, that I haven't seen any official calculations from Microsoft, particularly towards, specifically towards the log analytics, but in my own testing I've done, the servers we deployed it on have seen a negligible difference. There's been no real difference between uh, the, with the, the agent installed and without. So it gets back to data retention and charges for storage. Yeah. Yeah. All the processing, all the assessment, all the real work is done on the back end in Azure using the power of the cloud to offload that work out of your environment. Um, but yeah, as far as exporting goes, we were to go in and run this query here to see accounts that have failed to log in. We can export that data very easily to Excel just by clicking that button. And we're going to get a spreadsheet of all the results of this at this time. So speaking of this, I can see right now that I have 7,000 failed logins for administrator. I'm willing to bet that's probably on our cloud DC. That's probably related to the brute force RDP attacks. 
Yep, AZDC01. We can look easily and see the computer actually two different computers, AZDC and AZ Hub. So our two Azure servers that we don't really have firewalled very well. But we can see exactly what's happening to them. They're being attacked constantly with failed logins. Um, we made that password pretty Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> So this, this pane here gives us quick access into our account side of things for security. We can see immediately accounts that have logged in, what the trend is, failed to log in, what the reasons for failed logins are, um, logins over time. 92,000 92, logins on the operations manager server. That is curious. What's happening there? Uh, servers. Yeah, well, we can see right away they're all security events. Um, Let's uh, add the account. So what was that? What was that parameter name? Uh, account. Okay. That should already yeah, so be listed. So let's just go over to list. The DRA account. Yeah, we could come here and. Uh, Uh, let's, some things are case sensitive. So here, here are the distinct accounts that are that are doing these logins on the server. Mainly the scum data reader account, but also a few others. Apparently my account is also on there. That's fun. Um, so quick access to that information. So we're at 11:18. Now we're supposed to do it to 11:30. So we should probably go ahead and wrap up. We, Definitely more things I could talk about here, but let's go ahead and run back to the slideshow real quick, wrap this up, and then get to Q&A. So, oh, that's where I have the Q&A bit. All right, <laughs> so. And we're there. <laughs> so what kind of questions do you guys have at this time? Was this helpful? Okay. Hopefully this was useful. My, my goal here has been to show the kind of information that we can get without having to put much effort into it, the kind of things we can get from your on-prem environment today. Our demo environment there is almost entirely on-prem. All we've done is stamp the VMs and applied the agent. That's being done via OMS, via Azure Automation DSC. We've got automation in place via DSC to remediate that and make sure they're talking. And in Log Analytics, we can easily go in and see all that data and process it and get a whole lot of insights without having to do any real work. All that's just, it's just done. So this is easily applicable to your on-prem environments today as well. You can easily go out there, set up OMS workspace, deploy some agents, start pulling in data. It's very easy to set up a free tier to do some testing. If you've got Operations Manager today, it's very easy to connect that and leverage that existing infrastructure to get data into log analytics and get a lot of useful information. There's been meetings I've been in with clients where we've shown this off and set up a, a POC in their environment where we've had a few security team people in the meeting and we've gone to the security audit dashboard and quickly found like, oh, and here's this issue there. And they've had to pause the meeting and go fix problems because this showed to them issues they didn't know were happening in their own environment. And I'm not saying that the issues are happening or not happening in your environment, but this gives you a very easy way of leveraging a lot of extra information, a lot of machine learning, a lot of capabilities to find out if there are issues in your environment and address them proactively before they become an issue. So um, hopefully this has been useful. Uh, as far as upcoming sessions go, we've got a number of them planned. Here's a few that, we are, that we're planning. Uh, one is a deep dive into security and auditing using OMS. Uh, one is talking about server dependencies and mapping servers across uh, the connections across your organization. Uh, network analysis, automated remediation of issues, coordinated failover plans, user provisioning as an example, workflow, and a whole lot more is being planned. So uh, I definitely recommend if this was interesting or if you think any of those would be interesting, pay attention to our social media feed for more de details. But next deep dive is going to be up in two or three weeks. We'll be posting that online. 
be free to email us for questions, reach out to us, reach out to Microsoft. We're all available to help you out. Um, on the subject of service mapping, I just want to show one more of uh, one more solution real quick. Um, one of the relatively new solutions out here is called Service Map. And what this does, it uses a small agent that sits on the servers along with the Microsoft monitoring agent that maps out the connections, the TCP connections between servers in your environment and allows you to easily see what's talking to what and how they're talking so you can identify um, what impact it'll have in your environment if a server fails or if a service fails or whatnot. You can really determine what in your environment is talking to what. There's been plenty of clients I've spoken with when we've tried to set up Operations Manager. It's been like, okay, well, we need to monitor your, you want to monitor this application. Okay, what are all the servers in that application? I don't know, which makes it challenging. This solution makes that a lot easier because we can easily come in here and say select our domain controller and we can see all of the servers and clients that are connecting to it and what processes they're connecting to. We can see all of the other monitored servers that are connecting, what they're connecting to, how all these things are talking. We can filter in here. We can look and see immediately for the server that we're focusing on any related alerts, change data, performance data, for that server. We can look at security stance, update state. We can look at the servers that are connected to it and look at all that data all in one place. It's very powerful, very useful to understand your environment to help you quickly and easily troubleshoot issues, determine root causes, and remediate those problems. We're going to have a deep dive that covers this in detail from the perspective of the IT operations staff, how to use this to troubleshoot problems and find the root cause of issues in your environment. It's going to be awesome. I think so. Um, so I definitely look, think you should, you'd be interested in that one. Um, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them now or come up afterwards. Otherwise, thank you guys all for attending. I hope this was useful. I hope this was informative. I hope we've had a good morning. Um, and thanks for coming.